So, uh, so I, I put up, um, I put up this uh, semi-famous poem by William Butler Yeats, which was, in, you know, his version. One of the things we were talking about a couple weeks ago is. It, it almost always seems like we are at a time when revelation is upon us. And uh, after the second, after the, I'm sorry, after the Great War, after the First World War, um, you know, Yeats was not alone in thinking that what we had just gone through was a cataclysmic change for the world. And, um, um, and so uh, he, he, he recognized, as others did, um, could this be a time of the second coming, uh, the second coming of Christ. And uh, this poem is um, a little obscure. Uh, Yeats is a little obscure as a poet, but uh, um, I, uh, you know, I like uh, some of his early imagery here, turning and turning in the widening gyre, which is a, which is a whirlwind. Um, the falcon cannot hear the falcon, and things fall apart, the center cannot hold. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Um, yeah, 1920. 2020 um, it describes a lot of different times, I'm afraid. Um, and then you know he goes on to talk about uh, you know the uh, at the at the end uh, um, 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle uh, in reference to uh, Christ. Uh, and the birth of Christ. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. Um, uh, I think in Yeats's thinking, the rough beast was Herod, but that every time period has its rough beast um, that is ultimately an enemy of Christ and an enemy of, of the church. Um, and um, and so even in 1920, he's 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 wondering, um, you know, what, who's the next uh, dictator, who's the next uh, enemy of the church, and unfortunately, from our perspective, we could we could figure out a couple of options uh, <laughs> um, who've, who've since come around. Um, so. Um, just to uh, you know, just to put it in perspective, um, yeah, revelation has been on people's minds in a long time, for a long time, and uh, it 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 uh, interest in it uh, rises and falls um, with the times, and um, uh, well, what people don't realize, I mean, in, in you know, we, we remember Y2K in the year 2000, um, and um, uh, what people don't remember, uh, and none of us experienced, uh, was that actually uh, the same kind of anxiety was around in the year 1000, when the, when, when, you know, 990, the year 9, 999 uh, turned into the year 1000. And people were concerned that this has got to be the end of the world, um, the second coming. <coughs> Everything's <coughs> going to fall apart. Um, it didn't happen, um, uh, at least on a worldwide scale. It didn't happen, um, <coughs> but it always happens, and it happens at on smaller scales, on uh, individual scales, and sometimes they. They, those scales creep into um, bigger scales than we'd like them to. Um, and I also included, uh, you know, just a, a quick uh, little um, um, glossary here on numbers. Um, uh, 
just to let you know, um, you know, uh, a, this is just sort of a rough, um, sort of a rough glossary that you can use when you're actually reading the Book of Revelation. Uh, that the number three is uh, is considered a number of spiritual order in the universe. Um, and uh, you'll read in the Gospels, even before Jesus has been crucified and risen, uh, the Gospel writers will always say, and on the third day, this happened, um, which, is a, which is Gospel uh, shorthand for saying this was, this was part of God's plan. Uh, th th this was the spiritual order of the world that happened on the third day. Um, and uh, there are many times in biblical stories, in Old Testament and New Testament, where there's three people. Um, and we're supposed to be able to sort of read into that, the, God's in charge of this encounter. This isn't random. Uh, likewise, um, in the Gospel of John, for instance, and when uh, Peter says, I'm going to go fishing after Jesus has died and been resurrected, and he doesn't know what to do, um, we hear about five disciples who go with him, which sounds like it really is a random number. Um, you know, it's not, it just seems to be happenstance. And yet, for John's gospel, there is no happenstance. That's when Jesus appears. Um, but uh, anyway, so three is, uh, is this, um, is a very important number. Uh, about spiritual order. Four is the, uh, is the number that indicates uh, order in the natural world. It's the four directions. It's the four ancient elements. Um, fire, earth, sky, air. Fire, earth, water, air. I'm sorry. Um, and then when you add three and four together, you get the perfect number, which is seven. <laughs> uh, and why is it a perfect number? Well, I'm not really sure. But seven is a perfect number. It's the days of the week. It's the Lord's Day, the seventh day. Um, it is uh, it's, it's spiritual order plus creative order perfection. Um, six is the number of imperfection. We talked about that last week. Uh, uh, it, it is falling short of God's will and purpose, and part of its power is that it's so close to perfection, it deceives us. 666. Six, six. Um, uh, 10 is a number that signifies wholeness and completeness. Um, 12 is always Israel, it's always God's people, it's the chosen people, and here you've got three times 4, which equals 12. The perfect spiritual order, the perfect earthly order, multiply them together and you get Israel. The 12 tribes, the number of disciples, and every, um, every denomination, you know, 24, 48, 144, 144,000, they're all 12s. Uh, imperfection or perfection broken is three and a half. Um, the book of Daniel, Daniel talks about time times and a half. Uh, one plus two plus a half, three and a half. Three and a half is broke, is the brokenness of perfection. And, uh, and, uh, and then, and then there's this, um, there's this code uh, that has been developed alphabetically. If we were doing the code in English, it would be, you know, 26 letters. And um, A equals the number one, and you go through, um, uh, you go through K, or you go through J to get to 10. And then you start multiplying by 10. K is 20. 30, 40, 50, until you get to 100, which is the letter yes. uh, S. Oh, no, the letter T. Oh, yeah, S is 100. And then T, T is 200, and then it goes all the way up to Z, by the hundreds. 
And so when you take the letters of Jesus' name, for instance, it will add up to 888. Perfect plus one. Perfect <laughs> plus. And if you take the name in Aramaic, you take it from Greek to Aramaic, you get uh, uh, Kaiser, uh, Kaiser Neron, which is Nero, Caesar Nero, and his number adds up to 666. <clears throat> Somebody's played with this a lot, and they found that Adolf Hitler adds up to 666. Wow. So... Um, you want to start doing that on political candidates on your own time, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you figure it out. Um, I, I have done work on that, uh, but um, but that's the you know that's the that's the secret code, if you will. Um, that the forties. Somebody told somebody said that they were. I think it was uh, Mary Mary, um, uh, Mary Lee who was talking about a ministry who said everything's in code. Well, that's. This is one of the codes that's in scripture, and um, and I uh, uh, yeah I think it, it's a you know it's a I do think that you know John had in mind uh, Nero as um, as far as he was concerned he was the beast um, he represented uh, he represented chaos he represented Leviathan. And uh, we'll talk about that more as we get into the text today. Um, but, um, so that's a, I hope that's a handy little tool for you. Um, you know, um, that um, tells you a little bit about numbers, um, especially in the book of Revelation. What about 40? What about 40? 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, Jesus times. was in the wilderness. 40 days and 40 nights. Noah was. Noah was on the ark, 40 days and 40 nights. 40 is simply a, uh, a shorthand for long time. A long time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's us saying, um, yeah, well, we would, you know, uh, I don't know, kids would say, it's a gazillion. Um, 40 days and 40 nights. Um, whatever it is. Yeah, it's more, it's more than a month. It's more than one cycle of the moon, but it's not quite two, and that's a long time. So, yeah, this is a Hebrew society was a society that lived by a lunar calendar. I don't know. I think I, I've told people. I had a friend uh, at uh, who worked at Los Alamos Los Alamos Labs um, when I lived in New Mexico in the eighties and early 90s, he was on, uh, Los Alamos had a division known as the Origins Unit. Uh, they were trying to figure out how the world began. And, uh, and he, he, his special project was to try to live by a lunar calendar for a year. And uh, he, he told me he lasted five months. Uh, a lunar calendar meant he was um, living uh, basically uh, not a 24-hour day, but 21 and a half hours each day. And, and, uh, and so some days he's going to work at 8 in the morning, some days he's going to work at 4 in the afternoon, some days he's going to work at midnight. Um, and, uh, and he did that for four, maybe five months, and he had to stop. He was he was literally going out of his mind, uh, trying to keep time that way, um, and he decided nobody could ever have lived that way. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't care what the, the textbooks say; you can't live that way. Um, people have to live by the sun um, and not the moon. But, um, very interesting guy. Um, yeah, made, made and lost fortunes many times. Um, wow. Very brilliant in some ways, and also very quirky. <laughs> That's the word. <laughs> quirky. <laughs> quirky. Yeah. 
It was really fun to have coffee, if I'll tell you that. Uh, Excuse me? Yeah. Is that how you got lunatic? From well, lunatic? lunatic? Yeah, lun yeah. yeah, that is. That's how the word comes. Yeah, oh, wow. and, and I'm, I'm not sure they were trying to live, cool. you know, but lunatic has to do with, uh, and, you know, even police, police don't swear, you know, it's a full moon tonight. I'm we're going to be public. really busy. You work with the public? Yeah. You know yes. when it's a full moon. Yeah. yeah. Teachers yeah. always know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. librarians too. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say you kind of prepare for yourself when you're working with the general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's right. Very observant. Well let's uh let's let's dig into this a little bit. Um let's see um uh let's read the first uh, nine, ten verses of chapter eleven. It's on page two. That's what we want to read out loud for us. Then, go ahead. Uh, then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, come and measure the temple of God in the altar in those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample over the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy. Prophesy. Thank you. Uh, for 1,260 days wearing sackcloth. How far do you want me to read? Uh, to verse 10. Okay. <clears throat> These are the two olive trees and the two lampshades that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire pours from their mouths and consumes their foes. Anyone who wants to harm them must be killed in this manner. They have authority to shut the sky so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Perfect. And they have authority over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will wage war on them and conquer them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city that is prophetically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, members of the people and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in the tomb and the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and exchange presents because these two prophets tormented the inhabitants of the earth well it doesn't sound good depending on where you are in the story uh, you know, uh, but you're right. It doesn't really even sound good for the uh, for those who are giving testimony. Um, that do, do, doesn't work out well. So, uh, what what do you hear in it? What do you what do you hear that sticks out in, in this? Um, for um, there's a three and a half in there. There's a yeah. There's and there's a lot of three and a halves in there. Twelve hundred and sixty days. Um, whatever it was, the number of months it was, 40, 42. 42 months, all of that adds up to three and a half. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of uh, imperfection around here. Uh, things, things breaking apart. Um, Sodom, where Christ was crucified, I don't ever remember Sodom being... No. But what 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 is Sodom? What, what, Sodom is a is a, is a yeah it's a it's a place of evil. It's a place of inhospitality. Immorality. It wasn't Gomorrah also attached to that? Or? Yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah usually go hand in hand. This one, Sodom is paired with Egypt. They didn't like Egypt. Yeah. What's uh, so Sodom is uh, is uh, is a sinful city, uh, so sinful that God comes down and smites it, right? 
Uh, Egypt. What's wrong with Egypt? Yeah, partly. Yeah, it's also the place of slavery, right? Right. Okay. Idol worship, slavery, tyranny, Pharaoh. <coughs> Pharaoh is another word for Caesar. Uh. <clears throat> They're all cut from the same cloth. Yeah. So yeah, uh, and all of these are meant to uh, indicate Jerusalem, where our Lord was crucified. Yeah, John's not, John's not saying that Jesus was crucified in Sodom. He's saying Jerusalem became like Sodom. So evil, so inhospitable, so uh, sinful that the city needed to be destroyed. And by the time John's writing this, Jerusalem is destroyed. The... Um, the War, the Roman War, 66 to 73 A.D., the temple raised. R-A-Z-E-D, raised, uh, destroyed in, uh, in 70 A.D. So there is no temple when John is writing this. And uh, Jerusalem is destroyed because it became like Sodom and it became like Egypt. It became the heart of the Roman Empire in, uh, in the Middle East, in, in, in the land that we now call Palestine. It sound, as I was reading it, it sounds like a different John because the, the wording is more understandable and the, the imagery of the, all the dragons and all the seven is not in this reading. No, that's right. But it's going to, uh, yeah, I mean, he's going to get more uh, graphic uh, as he goes along. But yeah, this is, uh, this is his first attempt, uh, or his first vision. And um, the, the idea that, um, so, you know, I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told to come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. So, that's usually a call for reform. Something's got to change. Something's got to be new and different. And when the temple is restored, it will be a different temple. It will be a new temple. And, um, and, and it will restore what was ended. Um, in 7 AD, when they tore down the temple, that was the last time they ever did animal sacrifice in the temple. I, I was listening to the hymn this morning about, uh, you know, your, yeah, uh, may our voices be like perfume near the heart of our sacrifice. It was a line in the hymn this morning that we, what we listened to. And I, and I, you know, my background is growing up in, uh, my grandfather had a, um, um, my grandfather had a grocery store and a slaughterhouse. And he, he killed beef, he, um, he uh, cut beef, he sold the beef uh, to, um, to restaurants, to colleges, to hospitals, to nursing homes. Uh, that was his business. So, as a kid, I grew up around auction houses and slaughterhouses. And I can tell you, you know, there's no amount of perfume that gets that scent out of your nose and out of your head. But that is why uh, in Jerusalem and in the temple, they filled that place up with incense. Because otherwise, you're going there just to buy a, 
a, a little piece of roast beef, and you're going to faint from the smell of things because it's so vivid. So all that stuff about incense and perfume around our sacrifice, that's, to me, that is really graphic imagery. <laughs> it's just, ugh, it's right there. Um, I know the hymn writers had no thought of that at all. But, you know, the, the temple in Jerusalem was not like First Presbyterian Church. It, it, it doubled as a slaughterhouse. And that's why the Holy of Holies was in there, and I stood back from that as far as I could. Um, so, uh, you know, measuring is a, is a, is a means of, of reform. And this idea that the temple is going to be restored, I can tell you there's a, there's a small <coughs> network of farmers and ranchers in the United States today who are raising red heifers. This is from the book of Leviticus. Red heifers without blemish. Because they want Israel to have a red heifer for when the temple is restored and animal sacrifice begins again. Because that's a sign of the second coming. And they're raising unblemished red heifers so they're ready to give them to the state of Israel <clears throat> should the need arise. And there's somewhere in, in Revelation that says they're going to have animal sacrifices again? Well, it's when they when it starts talking about uh, uh, they will uh, come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. The, the altar is the horns. The altar is the place where everything is sacrificed on. So by mentioning the altar, they're saying, yes, oh, that's really terrible. Um, I don't want to be on tape with that. <laughs> um, but uh, the altar had these four horns on it, uh, these four things that suck up on it, and you laid the cattle across it so the blood would fall down. And so when you, when you kill the cattle on it, the blood falls to the ground, which is the only way to kill an animal uh, and have it be cleaned out of its bacteria and stuff. That's not good for it. Um, if, if blood is sitting there, I, I wouldn't eat that meat, it, no matter how much you pay me. Um, so, uh, the Bible, interestingly enough, is full of really good ideas for, uh, for human hygiene. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> how we, how we clean our food. Yeah. How we, to do with kosher? Uh, it does have to do with kosher, although uh, anymore almost everybody kills this way. But originally it was a definition of kosher, and now the other part of that is kosher is, you know, the rabbi's got to bless it before he kills it. So, yeah. Hebrew National. Kosher hot dogs? Because the, the rabbi prays over your hot dog before you eat it. Kills all the nitrates. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Yep. <laughs> yep. How do they yep. display the bodies? Like on the cross? Because everybody's supposed to gaze at them. The bodies? Of yeah. the cattle and so forth? No. The... Oh, yeah. Pro pro yeah. I would think that's a reference to the cross. Yes. I would think John is is referring to the uh, the prophets uh, being crucified. Yeah. So they were going to take these bodies that performed it. Who, who were here giving their testimony. So it says, you know, there's, you know, these two olive trees, uh, if you will, and you, it's interesting, um, and we, as we go further, I think it's a clear reference to Elijah and Moses as the two testimony. Interestingly, at uh, Transfiguration, Jesus goes up the mountain, takes three disciples with him, uh, and, uh, and they, Peter, James, and John, they see Elijah and Moses and Jesus all together. 
And that's what the, John here is alluding to. So there will be a day for Elijah and Moses to return and prophesy to us. And their prophecy will be a torment. We, we won't like what they have to say to us. Um, and, and uh, you know, here, you have here, uh, they have authority to shut the sky. They have authority over the waters to turn them into blood, to strike the earth with every kind of plague. That's what Moses did. In Egypt, right? Turns the river Nile into blood. Sends down plague after plague after plague. And still Pharaoh's heart is hardened. So it's suggesting we're gonna we're gonna we're, we're gonna find out what the Egyptians found out the hard way. We're gonna find that out too. Uh, while Elijah and Moses are testifying. But he um, didn't call for us to change. Yes, it is. Yeah. No, I think it is. It is. Yeah, I, I think it is. It's saying uh, to us, uh, yeah, um, get, your, get yourself uh, on the right side of this. Because uh, on the wrong side, but, but don't think that Moses and Elijah get out of this unscathed. Because, you know, they're going to be, they're going to be condemned just the way the world condemned Christ. So, um, yeah, uh, this is not uh, uh, heavy stuff. Yeah, this is not happy days are here again. Yeah. Uh, at least not yet. We'll get there, but not yet. All right. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that next part. Um, the um, Uh, I just want to uh, uh, I want to go down to verse 19 of chapter 11 just before we get to 12. Um, then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of His covenant was seen within His temple, and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. So, sometime when you're when you're clicking around your television set, you come upon the last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark. There it is, right there. Steven Spielberg knew his Bible. Uh, yes. Uh, they open up the Ark of the Covenant, and out comes lightning and thunder and earthquakes and hail. And uh, Indiana Jones somehow, maybe he's read the book of Revelation, he knows to cover his eyes. So. He isn't destroyed like everybody else is. But there it is. Book of Revelation. It's right there. Um, and, uh, and yeah, nobody had seen the Ark of the Covenant in a thousand years. But John sees it. It's a sign, again, of God's presence. And, uh, and uh, what, what had been hidden is now unveiled. The Ark has always been with us. And, uh, and I think what John understands is that Jesus is the Ark of the Covenant. He is uh, the, the lawgiver. He is uh, the keeper of the truth. He is the lamb on the throne. All right. And we didn't get that message because we think, like Indiana Jones thought, it's an actual thing. Yes. And not Jesus. It's a, yes. We have to go find. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Uh, and and actually, that's a theme for all the Johns uh, that we often misunderstand Scripture and Jesus because we want to take it so literally. And um, and over and over again, um, John wants to say that's not really what that meant. We, we hear Jesus say, I'm going to destroy my body. I'm going to destroy the temple in three days. And then in three days, I'll build the temple back up. And John said, and all the Jewish authorities said, he's threatening to tear down our temple building. He said, but after the resurrection and after the spirit, I understand Jesus was talking about his body. And that would be torn down and three days would be raised up. But 
Yeah. So, yeah. And so, taking this literally, uh, taking the book of Revelation literally, raising a red heifer in your backyard, I don't know that that's going to do it. One thing you, that we skipped over, verse 11 and okay. 14. I okay. just want to say, after they spat on and, and they treated the bodies of Elijah and Moses, uh -huh. after they laughed at them and celebrated their death, yes. God intervened. Exactly. Breathed life into them, said, come up into heaven, and then he reigned. Yes. His, his wrath. Yes. And yes. That, that to me is hopeful. Yes. Yeah, uh, you're right. And that's, uh, you know, yeah, God intervenes and, uh, and raises up the prophets. You can see the laughter of the people. Uh, Lord Almighty, you know, we see that too often. We saw it on 9-11 uh, where pe peoples in some parts of the world were cheering the tragedy that befell the United States. Uh, we, we saw it on October 8th. I mean, people were cheering the destruction of, of, of Israeli people um, by terrible means. Um, and, and, and notice what uh, the voices in heaven sing. They sing Handel in verse 14. Uh, the second war was passed, the third war is coming soon, the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's Handel. Handel? He loved Revelation. Yeah. All right, let's try, uh, cha let's try chapter 12 here. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Simon. But why is it that the uh, Spirit of the Lord uh, enters the bodies of the prophets after three and a half days? After three and a half days? Yeah, because you said three and a half is imperfection. Imperfect. But yeah. it's the Spirit of God, so it should enter them after three days. <laughs> but he, he, he only allowed their, their destruction for an imperfect time. For, uh, uh, for the three and a half days. It was, their, the destruction of Elijah and Moses is imperfect, but their resurrection is perfect. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, somebody want to read um, 12, just one through six. It's on page three. I'll read it. Um, Thank you. A great portent, say that word, portent? Portent, portent. yeah. Appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs in the agony of giving birth. Then another portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. Um, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to deliver a child so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a scepter of iron. But her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. And the woman fled to the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, so that there she can be nourished for 1,260 days. Again, her... Our time away is an imperfect time, but it, you know, she's nourished through it. Um, yeah. So, if you turn over to page four, you see a picture of the lady. Um, this vision became a vision in the 19th century known as Our Lady of Guadalupe. And she is pictured just as she is in the book of Revelation, except, uh, you know, the stars are not only on the hood uh, over her head, but also on the robe uh, that falls down her shoulders. Uh, the rays of the sun are behind her. She stands on a crescent moon, and the angels uh, hold her up uh, underneath there. Um, 
um, in New Mexico, um, people carry these things around, um, uh, a little token of Our Lady that you can hold on to, hold in your pocket, pray to any time you feel the need. Uh, <laughs> yeah, kind of like a uh, kind of like a rosary, but yeah, it's uh, and so she's. You know, and I don't think they're wrong. Uh, this, this sounds to me like Mary. This sounds to me like Mary. Um, and uh, the red dragon sounds to me like Herod, um, who wants to destroy the child almost as soon as the child is born. Um, a child is uh, snatched away to God and the throne room. And Mary goes out into the wilderness where she is nourished. Um, it's interesting. We'll read in a couple of weeks from the Gospel of Mark. Um, uh, after Jesus is baptized, um, Mark has a very short telling of the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Both Matthew and Luke tell us about 40 days that Jesus was in the wilderness uh, after being baptized and uh, uh, and then he's tempted by Satan the accuser um, Satan again I've said before uh, just a, a Greek word for the prosecuting attorney um, Satan is the accuser and Satan tempts Christ for 40 days and 40 nights. Mark just says, um, Jesus went out into the wilderness where he was tempted, but he was, uh, he was waited upon by the angels and the wild beasts. Which always seemed to me a very strange collection of people to wait on Jesus in the wilderness. But angels and wild beasts, and here it is, Mary goes into the wilderness where she is nurtured, I assume, by the wild beasts. They take care of her. Those wild beasts may not be as wild as we think. Did Satan have wings? <laughs> Did Satan have wings? I don't know. Obviously, the red dragon has wings. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, you know, we don't... Uh, it was John Milton who came up with the, the poem, uh, Paradise Lost, and it's his vision, which is 600 years old, eight, 700 years old by now, uh, that came up with this idea of Satan as a fallen angel. Um, scripture just says, um, you know, when it, when it refers to Satan, it will tell us a couple of different images. One that he falls from the sky, another one that he comes up from the depths of the sea, another one that he stands with one hand on the earth, one foot on the earth, and one foot on the dry land. Um, so we don't get a consistent image of Satan, and we certainly, you know, in the book of Job, we hear, you know, God speaking to Satan and saying, where have you been? I've been here, I've been there, I've been wandering the earth, looking for one person who loves you, oh God, and I haven't found anybody yet. Um, and, uh, you know, poor Job, uh, God says, have you tried my servant, Job? <laughs> Please, don't, don't yeah, look at me. Don't. Please. Yeah. I got a question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Ron. Dean. Um, yeah, so this is the second time that I know of, maybe you know of other examples where, you know, there's a woman and a, a serpent or dragon appearing at the same time in the Bible. I mean, does she have to go out into the wilderness because she's somehow associated with the dragon, or is it just because she's unclean because of childbirth, or...? Again, this is a. Um, uh, I, I want you to. I, I want you to catch all the references. Um, just like 
Sodom is not really just Sodom, and mm -hmm. Egypt is not really just Egypt, yeah. um, which the literalists among us will, will do, especially in the book of Revelation. They'll say, uh, you know, years ago they said, oh, uh, Abdul Nasser in Egypt, oh, it's a sign of the second coming. Uh, he's he, they've taken over the, the, the Suez Canal, we're all doomed. Um, uh, these images, Mary, I mean, the woman is, the woman is a lot of things. She is Israel. She is one of the daughters of Zion. She is Mary. Mary is the new Eve. Um, and and uh, and so all these images, you know, play together, and we get very confused by that, and our our uh, our our understanding of cultural signs and symbols has become very muddled in our time. Yeah. And personally, I think that uh, that that confuses us, and it leads to some. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a little bit of a union. I mean, Carl Jung said confusing cultural symbols is is a sign of madness, and uh, and I don't think he's wrong. Um, uh, you know, I was going to say this for next week or two weeks. I guess it's going to be three weeks. I'll, I'll repeat myself probably. <laughs> but but I, um, I was at um, I went with the with the um, VIPs. And we went to uh, we went and saw the Christmas uh, concert. Very good concert. I love Lansing Symphony. Singer was very good. I have issues with her producer. Uh, <laughs> her, her her producer, the singer, came out at one point. She's wearing a skippy Santa suit, yeah. and she's singing Mariah Carey song. All I want for Christmas is you, and she's running her hands over bald men's heads and you know <laughs> it's kind of a cute little scene and then she goes back and does a costume change or she plays another piece and then she comes out in an old white gown complete with a veil in the back and she sings oh holy night yeah. Yeah. Oh. so <laughs> if you understand your symbolism in one moment she is the whore of Babylon, and in the next moment, she is the bride of Christ. Right, right. And, and I hope to God that that producer didn't know what he was doing. Uh, I need to hire two different singers. But it's, the, it's, it's our cultural confusion at this moment. We don't, we don't do well with, with multiple symbols and understanding how these things uh, are bound together and how these things don't belong together and, and, and finding our truth in the midst of these symbols. It's one of the reasons I want to teach this class because this, you know, this book is, is guilty of confusing so many people. I mean, this is, you know, this is Charles Manson. Yeah. I read the book of Revelation. Yeah. Lord help us. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. David, yeah. what's his name? David Chapman, who killed John Lennon. Yeah. I read it in the Book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. It's like, oh. What about David Koresh? Is that one of his things? Oh yeah, David Koresh. He was uh, he he was hanging out until the you know until he got the seventh seal unsealed, and he was and his very name Koresh is a means son of David. Um, he gave himself that name. He wasn't born with that name. Oh, really? No, he no, he named himself Koresh, oh. which was a Jewish, uh, a Hebrew word for son of David. And uh, yeah, he he thought he he was the second coming of Christ. And that's why he needed all those guns. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. 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 So here is uh, this woman, and she is saved, uh, and so is her child. Uh, verse 7. Um, um, 
Yeah, let's, let's see if we can get to seven, verse 17. Uh, 7 through 17. Somebody want to read that? Also, it was allowed to wage war on the saints and to conquer them. Am I in the right place? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, I mean, it's a different translation, but yeah, you're in the same place. <clears throat> no. uh, oh. Page 5. No. Oh, no, page, page 3. And war broke out in heaven, it starts. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> war, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jeez. The, the dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil, and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. But they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, and <clears throat> by the word of their testimony. For they did not cling to life even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens, and those who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great <laughs> wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had delivered the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent, serpent into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. Then from his mouth the serpent poured water like a river after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman it opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to wage war on the rest of her children, those who kept the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Quite a war, huh? Yeah. And there you are. Yeah. Satan's Satan's angels have wings. Okay. <laughs> but if this is written for the Jews who don't believe that Jesus exists, how does the how do they how do they balance this? I think that um, I think this is written. Uh, you know, I think that it started out being written just for the Jews who had lost their temple. And that John then was converted and understood the crucifixion of Jesus to be uh, the, almost the same act as the destruction of the temple. And, and so he became a follower of Christ and he wants all those who are experiencing the desolation of the death of the, of the destruction of the temple to turn to Christ. And this would be part of his effort to say that God is with Miss Mary, our new Eve, our, the daughters of Zion. And, and God is going to protect her and protect her child. But that doesn't mean it's going to be the end of all of the devil's doings. Um, he is thrown down to earth. And that's where he has power to wreak havoc. But his power is time and times and half a time. Three and a half years. It's an imperfect power. And he knows it. The devil knows it. Satan knows it. His time is limited. Which is why he is so hell-bent on destroying now while he can does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's I think that's what's going on here. And we're supposed to be invited to understand 
that, um, yeah, we're going to throw in with Christ, we may, we may experience some of this tragedy. We may experience some of this chaos. Um, and they often did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, John himself is writing this from prison, right? Um, and sending, out, sending notes out, you know, hidden in wherever he can hide them so that the notes get out and the book gets translated. And we have it. Um, Would he have sent them to Apostle Paul's churches? Would have eventually gotten, especially, we, we know it especially gets to the seven churches of, uh, of Asia Minor, or what is today Turkey. Um, yeah, Laosidia, um, Pergamon, places like that. And uh, so one copy gets out, they make other copies, it goes to seven churches, they make copies, and they take them with them when they travel, and the word spreads. I mean, it would have been a very, um, you know, it's not as simple as, you know, hitting send on our computers. Yeah. Uh, it would have been a very time-consuming um, time task to do that. Well, I spent some time in Turkey in the military, and Turkey is the most dangerous place yeah. on earth that I've probably ever been. Yeah, yeah. So why would we send good news to... Well, it's interesting. I mean, this was, you know, in the first century, and the second century, and the third century, number one, it became, um, it became the center, Constantinople, named after the Emperor Constantine. And it became the center of the, of the, of the early church. Uh, the church understood itself with two centers. It was, a, they understood themselves to be an ellipse with a center in Rome and a center in Constantinople. And interestingly, you could be arrested in Rome for being a Christian until 312 AD. But in Constantinople, you were free. You were free to worship Christ. So in many ways, it was more influential center for the church. Um, one of the tragedies of today is that uh, uh, since the year, I'm not, don't quote me on this, but sometime around 2005 was the last baptism in Turkey. Oh. Uh, it's become so much a Muslim country now, and uh, and and when you go to ruins of the ancient churches that we're talking about here, many times you'll find kids playing soccer uh, in between the ruins. Um, it's, uh, you know, the church has, uh, you can still go to a service, a worship service in the, uh, uh, in the cathedral in Constantinople, uh, but you, you can't be baptized. And, um, and there are rare occasions that they will allow the sacrament um, uh, of the Lord's table to be to be done in Constantinople, hmm. and that's how far things have come in 17, 1800 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. How far they've come, or how far they've sunk? How far they've sunk? <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. How far they've sunk? Yeah, yeah. But there, you know, uh, when when this was happening, this was this was the the uh, the heart of the new Christian church there in what we used to call Asia Minor. I mean, this is where Luke first heard Paul preaching and became a Christian and started writing his gospel. So uh, all this stuff, um, you know, started here in Turkey. And by the time you got there, it was a skeleton of that. Yeah. Aren't they in the process of trying to take over the world, actually? Uh, you mean Erdogan, or do you mean the the Orthodox Church, or yeah, the, uh, people in Turkey? People in Turkey? They're going out into all of the different countries. England is very much. United States is 
There are countries that will not allow them in. Mm, interesting. Period. Interesting. Will not allow them. Interesting. I, yeah. I, I don't know of their plans for world domination, but nothing surprises me. Simon. I've seen a documentation about people in uh, Turkey and Constantinople, uh, Istanbul. Istanbul now, now yeah. Uh, they really like Christmas markets. And they have Christmas markets in their streets. Yes. And they go out at the Christmas times and buy all the decoration. Yes. And the sweets. <laughs> and yes. they think it's great. Yes. They're Muslims, but yes. they like it. <laughs> they like Christmas. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I know. Uh, yes. We. <laughs> in the neighborhood we lived in in Cincinnati, we had uh, uh, we had some Muslim neighbors down the street, and uh, and I'll tell you that at Christmas time they were the only neighbors that brought presents to all of us. It was a very Catholic neighborhood, <laughs> but but the Muslims gave out the Christmas presents. <laughs> very interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, to be fair. Uh, you know, Jesus is the second most important prophet in Islam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So his birthday is kind of important, but still, <laughs> it's kind of weird to get Christmas presents from your Muslim neighbors. Yes. I would take it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> I'm hospitable. Thank you. <laughs> I think. Um, this goes back to my other question. So, can, could this maybe be read as a Eve redemption story in a way, kind of? Uh, I think so. I mean, yeah. Uh, I, I think it, I'm, I'm thinking it's a. I, I want to say John is very interested um, in keeping his imagery so that it. It is male and female balanced. So this isn't all just, you know, a bunch of men fighting, like the Old Testament, unfortunately, mostly is. Um, but that, you know, there are stories of women and uh, their role, both good and bad. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, uh, I think, but I also think it, it, it hints at some legends that are out there. I mean, um, the Roman Catholic Church says that Mary was bodily ascended into heaven. That she didn't die, she just went, uh, she just went up to heaven. The Assumption of Mary, a doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, that was not a doctrine of the church until the 19th century about 1850, 1860, the Catholic Church made that a doctrine. But before that, a lot of people believed it. And, um, and what's interesting is you go into an Orthodox Church, an Eastern Orthodox Church, and they'll have two paintings. One will be the painting of Christ Pantocrator, Christ the uh, King of the Universe and full-on portrait of Christ. The second painting they'll have is the painting of Mary's funeral. And you'll see Mary's funeral. You can go down to Holy Trinity. They've got a beautiful painting of Mary's funeral. Great funeral service she had. Uh, not biblical, by the way, but part of the understanding of Eastern Orthodox Christians. So take your pick. Yeah, because that's not never addressed in the scriptures, right? It's never addressed. It's never addressed. But this seems to address, Revelation seems to address uh, the, that, that Mary is uh, assumed into heaven. Re Revelation, and you're right, there's a, an element. This is, this is Eve's redemption, if you will. And there, there's a reason why, you know, Mary is considered the new Eve, and Jesus is the new Adam. They weren't husband and wife, yeah. but... They represent the new humanity. I'm asking because we're, we're reading a medieval German text, and it starts out with a princess, and she's beautiful and everything, but then it's announced everybody's going to die, and it's all her fault. So, you know, I think there may be an Eve parallel there as well, and it's just interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And there's also a dragon. So. There you go. Yeah. German, uh, German folk tales are, are, are yeah. very influenced by the Book of Revelation. And, uh, and 
Yeah, and by the time Disney gets a hold of them, you know, all all that dark stuff is gone. Oh yeah. And you know, cute little animals. That's right. That's right. Adorable trip. And they lived happily ever after. The end. Uh, Can there be a? I don't understand that this is the New Testament. Yeah. Is John after Christ, and he's not one of the disciples? Or does he carry over from B.C. to A.D.? I think this John is after Christ. I think he comes to faith in the 30, 40 years after Jesus was crucified and risen. So he's writing things off of scrolls? He's or? writing things onto, uh, he probably doesn't have a scroll, but he's writing things onto papyr papyrus, which can be uh, you know, pocketed hidden away, um, and, um, and yes, his vision is of, uh, it's both, it's a, it's a vision of what has gone before, it's a vision of what is yet to come, and it's a vision of what is today, that um, we, are, we are among those being persecuted uh, as people in the church, um, if you were Jewish, you were persecuted because your city was torn down to its to its bare bones. And uh, if you're a Christian, your Lord was hung on a tree. But God is not done with us yet. Okay. Yeah, that, I mean that's <laughs> yeah that's really a good recap of yeah. All that gobbledygook that's... Yeah, it is. There's a lot of gobbledygook. In the there really is. And, uh, and I keep trying to... I, I'm hoping that I'm clearing out some of the gobbledygook for you. Um, it's still there. Um, and I think, uh, you know, every time I read it, I have, you know, 76 new questions. Um, but... Um, um, uh, but, uh, you know, John, uh, you know, John is trying to keep us hopeful um, and persevering um, in the midst of trials. Yeah. So um, I just want to, because I won't get to this in two weeks, but I just want to do the quick uh, um, 11. Um, on page five, um, um, then I saw another beast that rose out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all authority on the, of the first beast on its behalf, and it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. Um, that's, uh, that's Nero had a scar on his forehead, mm. and if you were around in the 1980s and you heard anybody talk about relations, they all said, that's Gorbachev, yeah. um, the yeah. fatal wound, yeah. 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 yeah, his birthmark, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. he's it's the second beast. Growing. It performs <laughs> great signs, world. even making fire come down from heaven to the earth in the sight of all, and by the signs that it is allowed to perform on behalf of the beast, it deceives the inhabitants of earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could even speak and cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Again, people will say that's the picture of Stalin on every wall in the Soviet Union and behind the Iron Curtain. You couldn't go into a store uh, even though Stalin had been dead for 20 years, his picture was on every store wall when I was there in 1977. Um, it also causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to be given a brand on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell who does not have the brand, that is the name of the beast or the number for its name, this calls for wisdom. Let anyone with understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number for a person, and its number is 666. That's Nero 
as uh, as um, uh, as I, I mentioned earlier. Um, again, um, you know, uh, in the time of Nero, the two beasts were Nero and his general Flavian, who was the one who actually destroyed Jerusalem, who led the campaign to destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD. So they are the two beasts. Um, you know, in more recent times, people have said that's Hitler and Goebbels. Would it be Putin now? <laughs> Would Putin be 666? Well, I don't know that his name adds up, but I think he would be. Yeah, I, I, I could play with that uh, long enough to get Putin the number six. I know I could. I like it. Yeah, I know I could do it. But yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, again, I think there are correlations with today, unfortunately. Um, notice that, uh, again, um, these uh, these these beasts are you know given standing, but it's only for a time. It's not the last word. Uh, in fact, the next word in chapter fourteen. Then I looked, and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were one hundred forty-four thousand who had his name and his father's name written. On their foreheads. Um, yeah, 144. Yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses thinks that's the limits to heaven. Yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses, that's the limit to heaven. Um, that's why Presbyterians read this uh, figuratively and not literally. Uh, we think there's plenty of room in heaven for all of us. Uh, but. Um, and the, the mark on the forehead, uh, you don't see this in the movie Gladiator, but um, yeah, all, all of Roman gladiators would have a tattoo put on their forehead to tell everybody that they belong to Caesar. Uh, they would wear a, a tattoo on their forehead. And so, uh, and that gave you privileges, but it also gave you uh, limitations in Rome. And John's vision is, you can't see our tattoo, but it's there. We are marked with Christ. Mm -hmm. Yep, we are marked with Christ. So, I'll let that be the last word today. <laughs> you know, we are marked with Christ. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk more about the harlot and the bride uh, when we come back in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, on Fe uh, yeah, February 18th, uh, we'll, and then February 25th, we'll talk about uh, the end of all things, um, which hopefully will end on a positive note. Okay?